This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. There may not be a Conor McGregor at UFC 303, but we still got some pretty fun fights lined up for the next pay-per-view, which is tomorrow. And here today to break down all those fights, including the main event is Austin Swain. We're going to pick Austin's brain on that uh, main event between Pereira and Pochaca. We're going to talk about other money lines, Austin likes, top props, and much more to get you ready for UFC 303. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of Digital Media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as mentioned by Austin Swain. You can find him on X at a Swain 3 Find his work over at FanDuel Research and over on the FanDuel Research podcast feed. Austin, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Jim. It is International Fight Week, so that's why Conor McGregor was supposed to be on. They had a cool fan festival, a lot of interactive stuff for UFC fans. Um, and that, that made, that's always a good time. That's a bucket list item for me. I didn't get to go this time. I'm, I'm moving in two weeks, so right. couldn't coordinate a flight out to Vegas. But that's a bucket list item for me that they do this whole cool tour, and then they loaded up this fight card really through some dire circumstances. So it should be a great Saturday. I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I got a few bets picked out for you and everybody else out there. Love to hear that. Uh, how is the allure of this card once you take McGregor out of action? Yeah, I mean, Conor McGregor has an interesting relationship at this point where he's not really a title contender, but he is yeah. still one of the sport's brightest stars. Michael Chandler was a really solid opponent for him. That fight was a pick him before it dropped out. We'll probably see Conor not too long. It was a legitimate injury, not just general McGregor nonsense at this time. So um, we'll probably see Conor not too long, but... All things considered, I think they got this up to a pay-per-view standard of a card, which is awesome in a couple weeks' time. Okay. Well, love to hear that. We're going to break down uh, that main event between uh, Pereira and Prohaska. We're going to talk about other money lines and props and much more to get you ready in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Covering the Spread, hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating and review as well. So do you want to mention again, Austin is talking UFC uh, on the FanDuel Research podcast feed talking top bets and DFS plays there. So if you want some more in-depth thoughts on USC 303, find that by searching for FanDuel Research podcast. The dog days are here and the coolest place to get in on the MLB action is FanDuel, America's number one sports book because this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There is something for everyone all every day, all summer long. You can score bigger winnings in any inning with Profit boost, snag bonus bets for home runs every Tuesday, even beat the heat with no sweat bets. So head over to FanDuel and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball must be 18 plus in D.C. and 21 plus in president select states. Opt in required. Wager requirements apply. Bonuses awarded as non withdrawable bonus bets or profit boost tokens. Restrictions apply, including bonus expiration. See terms and conditions at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, DC, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Vermont, Virginia, and Wyoming. Call 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 789 seven seven or visit ccpg.org slash chat connecticut 1-800-9 with it in indiana 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in kansas 1-877-770-STOP in louisiana visit mdgamblinghealth.org in maryland 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. Hope is here. Visit GamblingHelplineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's take a look now at this UFC 303 card, Austin. Let's begin things by talking about that headliner. Again, Alex Pereira taking on Yuri Prohaska. And we're going to talk about the actual markets for this fight in a second. But first... How do these two match up to you stylistically? 
Um, I think in a word, it's guaranteed action. Well, that's that's two words. So great work by me there. <laughs> but um, I, look, this is a rematch of a fight that we saw last November. It ended up being one of the most intense stare downs lead up to a fight as they were doing the announcements. These guys were just staring right into each other's eyes. They both believe in dark magic, which is really cool. Um, okay. They are true throwback martial artists, warriors, and there's fewer than one combined takedowns per 15 minutes here. So this is really a striking match between two very different styles. Alex Pereira, former glory kickboxing champion. He is the definition of technical elite leg kicks, thoughtful combinations. And then there's Yuri Prohaska, elite pressure, great vision with his eyes. He's willing to eat damage and roll with shots in order to advance. And this is a rematch of the first fight, like I said. Yuri Prohaska actually won the first round. He won it by actually securing a rare takedown, a couple minutes of control time. And then in the second round, Alex Pereira drops him. Ends up getting Yuri to the floor in that exchange. The referee stops the fight. It was a little bit controversial. It was a little bit early. So we kind of knew these two were going to run back the fight at some point. There, I think it was a decently decided result in Pereira's favor. But the thing, the way that UFC works with probability, I don't think that's a guarantee that that's the way this fight ends when the two of these guys lock, lock horns again. 80% plus finishing rate on both sides. They are both very, very dominant, powerful strikers. So I can't wait to watch the rematch here. So it should be a fun stylistic matchup. We've seen some movement here on the money line for this one. Pereira now minus 148. He was minus 154 yesterday. Prohaska currently plus 120. So any preference for you, any read for you on the money line in this fight? Yeah, at least infamously to me, I talked about this fight was exactly a 50-50 coin flip in my model in November. So I was like, that's not very helpful picking a winner. Both of these guys added wins at UFC 300 in emphatic fashion. They were both knockouts. The striking numbers were very close. So it wasn't a surprise when I re-rack things less than a year later. I've got Pereira at minus 105, 51.4% likely to win. So it's a close fight. And I think there are a lot of variables each time these guys meet. So I, I took Prohaska's money line earlier this week in the plus 140s. I think plus 120 is still acceptable. At least it is per the model here. Um, it could have been had as high as plus 142 Sunday. And then we even saw it dip as low as plus 112. So you're right that we've had a lot of movement here. I don't want to overreact to the result in the first fight, not only because of the controversy, but because Prohaska won the first round. Pereira's 36 years old, so he's kind of on the wrong side of the analytical prime for a UFC fighter at 30. Yuri's 31, so he's much closer to it. Um, we saw Alex Pereira knocked out at middleweight by Israel Adesanya. That is a like weight class 20 pounds lighter than Yuri and the guys he's facing now. So it can be devastating if Prohaska lands as well. I see this fight much closer to a coin flip, so Prohaska at plus 120 is a pretty solid proposition. Obviously, we've seen some movement in this market, and mm -hmm. it sounds like your model has Prohaska at plus 105. Yep. So where's the breaking point for you where you say, actually, I'm good? Is it plus 115? You know, how close are we to the point where you're like, if someone pulls up their phone on Saturday morning and sees, hey, it's plus 115, yeah. where's the breaking point for you? I think I think plus 110 is my breaking point okay. to a point where we've got enough variance mixed in. Pereira's UFC sample actually isn't as large as you would think it is. So yeah. the, the analytics are maybe a little iffy when these guys have such devastating consequences. But I do think that this fight should be a pick -em. I thought the first fight, which was a pick -em, should have been a pick -em, And I don't want to overreact to the first result. So if you wake up plus 110 on Saturday and you really are interested in betting for Hazka, I would still give a thumbs up to do so. Um, but that's why it's good to dive into markets early before you know, before they're too matured and get the best of the number. Yeah, I'd, I'd take a plus 140 if you gave it to me. That'd be nice. Uh, a plus 120 is still a value per Austin's model. What about player props uh, for or props for this fight, Austin? Anything stand out to you there? Yeah, so if if the money line gets to a point where you don't feel comfortable betting it, I like Yuri Prohaska to win in the middle rounds of this fight. So I actually took small sprinkles. If you go to the round betting five rounds tab on FanDuel Sportsbook, I took small sprinkles at, uh, oh, oh, it was in popular. Uh, Nope. There, are, there are so many markets on FanDuel to dig through. There it is. So I like Yuri Prohaska to win in round two plus 800, round three plus 1300, and round four plus 2100. Obviously, given the size of these numbers, these are not full unit betting spots, but I'm showing fight, uh, a value on the fight to not start round four. I've got it at plus 190. It's plus 170 on FanDuel. I'm adding round four to be safe again because the analytics of these two are a little bit... Like, I know who they are analytically, but the same 
samples are still pretty small with sub 10 UFC fights on each side. Yuri is a slow starter. He had a negative 20 striking differential against Alexander Rakic in his last fight, negative 13 against Glover Teixeira in his previous title fight. The only fighter where he's actually been tied, oddly enough, it was Alex Pereira, but that's because he got the takedown in the control time. I specifically want to target after the first round and and before really the, this fight trends toward a decision, which would be in the fifth round as well. In the middle somewhere of this fight, you know, Yuri Prohaska stunned us by submitting Alex Perez coach and mentor Glover Teixeira. I think he does have submission upside here. Obviously, we've talked about the knockout and the devastating power here. I wanted to encompass all of those, and you do with these bets here. So maybe if the money line isn't your forte and you just wanted a smaller bet on a specific method, this fight is overwhelmingly likely to knock out the distance. Prohaska, I think I can chuck out round one and then target some sort of middle round outcome for him. All four of his UFC wins by finish, second round or later. So I think Yuri is in a good spot to win kind of in this sandwich in the middle. Okay, so those numbers for Austin here in this one are Prohaska to win in round two is eight to one. Prohaska in round three is 13 to one. Prohaska in round four, 21 to one. So we're expecting this fight to finish early, just hopefully not too early, and hopefully in Prohaska's favor as well. Plenty of other fights lined up across UFC 303. Austin, what other money lines are you targeting on Saturday? Yeah, let's turn to the co-main event of the e evening, which is a far different co-main event than we were expecting. It's between Brian Ortega and Diego Lopez at Featherweight. And really, this is sort of a coronation for Lopez, potentially. Three straight first-round finishes, has the weird emo mullet haircut. Like, they're, they're, everything about this dude screams star. But I, I'm saying not so fast, my friend, with Brian T-City Ortega here at plus 118, because... I think that Diego Lopez being favored over a top five guy based on the small samples we've seen is a little crazy. Lopez still has questions in his analytical profile. He lost his first two UFC fights by decision, seeding 56.5% of the total duration of those in control time. And Ortega can wrestle. Um, you know, Ortega's not fragile like some of the opponents that he's faced and been finished in the first round. 1,003 career significant strikes absorbed for Ortega. He's been dropped twice. The guy is iron, um, and he's He's never been submitted professionally either. In terms of winning minutes, Lopez is a 37% striking defense, 42% takedown defense. My question becomes, what happens when someone is durable enough to survive the first flurry? I think Brian Ortega answers that. My model even factoring in all of Lopez's upside, the power, the submission danger. I've still got Ortega at plus 110, so I show value here. Um, this line has been roughly around here most of the week. It was plus 125 on Sunday, so... It's kind of stayed in this same similar range, but I still like T-City um, to give the young buck a little bit of a lesson on Saturday. That is for the Brian Ortega versus Diego Lopez fight. Austin is on the Ortega money line, currently plus 118 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And again, he would show value down to plus two or plus 110 on that one. Any other money lines stand out to you across Saturday? Yeah, so let's stay in the same division, but flip over to the prelims because Charles Jordan is taking on John Silva in the same division at featherweight. I think it's a very simple handicap around Charles Jordan at this point. If you can land takedowns on his awful 48% takedown defense and avoid one specific counter move to them, you'll probably beat him. Jordan undefeated in three UFC fights where his opponent failed to land a takedown, but he's four and six in fights where they did. And it gets even worse when two of those four wins were using a guillotine choke, which is a specific choke designed to counter wrestling advances. On the other side here, Jean Silva training with my guys at the Fighting Nerds. They are prepared for the guillotine choke. It's not a oh, it's not a surprising submission. It's not overly likely or high percentage. And he's just gotten a couple of unsuspecting grapplers in it. Silva is not one of those. He averages 1.56 takedowns per 15 minutes. I trust his gym. I trust his own durability. He's never been finished professionally. Uh, I bet Silva at plus 105. I can't quite model him yet because his sample doesn't meet the 45 octagon minute threshold that I use to be safe. But I feel very comfortable he wins this fight by decision using his takedowns. Or he might even be able to snag a submission, which is 12 to 1 on FanDuel 2. I haven't even gotten to the point where he's got a plus 1.56 striking success rate and could be competitive in a striking match here. I think he just takes the path of least resistance. And that's why I love the fighting nerds, guys, because they do take the path of least resistance. I don't have to worry about it. And it sounds like there has been interest in that Silva by submission prop because that's now down to 11 to 1 at FanDuel yep. Sportsbook in the method of victory. So it sounds like other people are on the same page as you. And again, the Silva money launch is where Austin is going here. Minus 105 taking on Charles Jordan. Jordan? Jordan? Jordan. Either one. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's go, go with that. What about some player or some props? Uh, any props stand out to you for Saturday? Yeah, so both of my props didn't plan this are on the main card as well. We you go. may not even remember this, but last year you and I talked about a random Vegas card, UFC Vegas 69. I gave you Myra Bueno Silva by submission. It was plus 190 and it cashed. I think we can run it back here at plus 310. She's taking on Macy Chasson on the main card. Myra Bueno, in her last fight, her title shot didn't go well. She was dealing with flu-like symptoms, which really stinks. When you have this title opportunity, you get the flu. Um, she looked totally gassed against Raquel Pennington. I was really surprised how that fight played out, but then it made more sense once once we figured out she was having flu stuff going on. I think she's in a good spot to rebound here against Chasson when uh, the lady that just beat Myra Bueno Silva, Rocky Pennington, she has just one submission since the start of 2016. It came against Chasson, and I just don't know if Chasson has improved her grappling because zero UFC wins by submission for the last three Chasson has faced since she faced Pennington. So now here is a very dangerous submission threat in Myra Bueno Silva, 1.6 attempts per 15 minutes. Um, Elite and elite submission results as well. Four UFC wins by submission. I got Myra Bueno Silva modeled at 29% likely to win by sub. That's plus 245 implied. I think there's value when it matches my anecdotal assessment of this fight that Myra is by far the best grappling threat Macy has faced in UFC. And I think she gets tapped at a pretty high clip here. Okay, that is plus 310. Bueno Silva by submission in this matchup, taking on Chasson. Uh, some quality names across this card. So Absolutely. kudos to UFC for uh, getting the good names out there. But Bueno to you. Yes. Yeah, so another, the as we were shuffling the McGregor stuff around, another fight that just came together two weeks ago was Anthony Smith taking on Roman Delizze. Delizze actually is a natural middleweight. So he's moving up to 205 pounds, but he's also fought at 205 pounds before. So I don't think the size is a huge deficit here. That's why you see Roman favored in general in the betting markets here. And I am one of Anthony Smith's biggest haters. So if my model and my line of thinking are taking Anthony Smith, there's probably some fire behind that smoke. And I'm really shocked that this line is so high when amidst some beatings of the worst variety, Roman Delid say his toughness has never wavered. He's never been finished. He hasn't been finished in his last three fights amidst a negative 135 striking differential. He squeaked by to be one and two in those fights, but it's just not been good on the feet. Uh, if you go to the method of victory tab, I like Anthony Smith by decision here because Smith is not a power puncher himself, 0.88% knockdown rate, but he should be ahead at distance. Delize's had significant issues there. At least Smith can work behind his jab. It's a little tough to compare apples to apples with these guys because Smith has been fighting championship caliber fighters at 205, Roman Delize a little bit below that at this point. But I also think Smith can wrestle a little bit. Delize has a 33% takedown defense. There are a lot of ways for Smith to win minutes here when Delize doesn't have any wins by submission. A few of his knockouts were ground and pounds, and he'll probably be the smaller guy here. So all in all, I, I lean on this fight to go the distance. That's kind of a lean from my model. But I prefer just targeting Smith by points instead. It's plus 370. My model's got it at plus 215. And it goes really hand in hand when I think of, I don't know what's going to get Roman Delize out of there if he survived his last three fights. Um, and I certainly don't know if Anthony Smith has the tools to do it. So I like I like Smith to win on the cards. And it sounds like based on what you're saying that Delize is not a guy who's going to thrive if it does go to the decision based on what he's done so far. No, he's not a great minute winner. We saw him lose a, a competitive decision against uh, Trevin Giles and then less competitive decisions against both Marvin Vittori and uh, no no certain a M evolve in his last fight. All those guys outside the top five, whereas Lionheart, former title challenger, I feel the level of competition is different and Delize has been very tough through through even not doing well against lower competition. Okay, so that's Anthony Smith by decision, plus 370. Myra Bueno Silva by submission, plus 310. Silva topping Jordan, minus 105. The Ortega money line, plus 118, along with Prohaska to win, plus 120 with the Prohaska round props that Austin mentioned as well. That is Austin Swain. Make sure you check him out on X at Swain 3 Find his work over at FanDuel Research and check him out on the FanDuel Research podcast. We'll be talking UFC 303 later on today. Austin, I appreciate the time. As always, enjoy UFC 303. Good luck to you and your bets. We'll talk to you once again soon. Thank you, Jim. I'll see you soon, bud. All righty. And you can find again Austin on, on X at Aceway 3. I am on X at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on X at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across this weekend. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> 